I was listening to your uh, your very entertaining interview. I was oh, yeah. listening to to you on uh, on some podcasts. Ooh, so you ooh. were part of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, or was that a poetry thing? I've I've been on uh, um, something like that. I wasn't in the actual Edinburgh one, but I was on some like Fringe Extension. Yeah, I've done I've done a couple of those. It's different. I love French and yeah. I love your uh was it fuck everybody poem yeah <laughs> yes that was good it was uh it was it was very poetic you know that's actually more difficult to write that than a lot of the ones that people think are um more wordy or poetic or whatever because you gotta get the rhythm right and you have to like you know yeah. you know you know who who to say fuck you to and like you have to pick those out I mean it was actually more that was actually required more editing than a lot of things that are, are, are seen as more poetic. <laughs> very tight, you know, cause your rhymes, you know, like the beats just hit and, uh, and it did have like a nice alliterative, you know, kind of detail to it. So bravo, bravo. Oh, thank you, bravo thank, you. thank you so much. All right, so we're live. We're joined this hour by Pocho Pena. She is a filmmaker, um, an organizer of um, events. She is a, um, as a multimedia artist, um, gosh, she's been involved in so many different things. It's, it's really, really exciting to, uh, to have you here. Um, so I want to start, though, before we get into the, the, the OC Film Fiesta, before we get into your background um, um, in you know, visual arts and your, your, your work as, uh, in filmmaking, uh, let's start at the beginning. So like, how did you, um, I want to ask you about how you got started as an artist, but first I want to ask you about, um, I want to ask you about something, because you and I have a shared experience that you might not be aware of, right? So when I was uh, in my younger years, I used to ride on the back of this, uh, this tram and I would say things like, uh, welcome aboard the Mickey and Friends uh, tram. If you are parked in the Timon and Puma lot, you are on the wrong tram. Please exit the left, but you are going to Mickey, Donald, Minnie, uh, the driver, you're all clear. So <laughs> tell us about working at Disneyland. Uh, well, my dad worked at Disneyland. Uh, he was a carpenter. He started out as a as a gardener, I believe, when they were building the park. So uh, I grew up on stories of, of Walt, you know, walking the grounds and uh, talking to all the employees. I guess he was really personable and really involved. And um, and I knew all the Mexicans that were just, Disneyland. you know, all the trumpet players were mariachi trumpet players, most of them. And uh, my trumpet player was, was, was one of Sleeping Beauty's trumpet players. And, uh, you know, we had the um you know just that whole kind of like americana donald duck wears a serape on cinco de mayo kind of thing you're like we made it it's just like sesame street you know and then you know you you move beyond that and you see that the world is very much not disneyland but while you're on the park in the park it's really a surreal place so i grew up uh you know getting snuck backstage and and watching my dad work on 30 foot styrofoam sandwiches, you know, airbrushing the lettuce and doing the, you know, uh, learning new ways of carving because he needed to do some alpine wood detail, you know, and he's a Chicano from Texas, you know, so it was, it was really um, a, fa a fabric of, a factory of dreams, you know, it was like your dad worked for Melier or something, you know, it was a very beautiful and surreal experience. I remember seeing um, Goofy and Donald uh, smoking, you know, like in the, in the commissary and it totally blew my mind because they were, they were hippies, you know, under their, under their heads, they had long hair and bandanas. So, you know, I grew up with that um, line between fantasy, fact and fantasy being um, not a very solid line. And so do you have a Disney connection? Yeah, I I, no, I worked. I worked the tram. I mean, oh, like you I, worked there. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I was the voice on the back. I mean, I was. I was. Uh, we're a driver. We're all clear. It was like, uh, I, you know, I, I, I messed it up, but it was like, uh, you know, it was like, um, I woke up for the Mickey and Friends uh, courtesy ride. Uh, if you are parked in the Timon and Pumbaa lot, you will enter the wrong tram. Please gather your belongings and exit the left. If you are, however, parked in Minnie, Donald, Goofy. Mickey. Right, <laughs> Chippendale. For the parking lot. Yeah, that was well, on the correct <laughs> All guess. right, driver, we're all clear. If you look to your left, we're constructing Terror Tower. You know, like it's supposedly... Are you from Orange County originally? 
No, no, no. But like, I'm originally from El Sereno. I'm originally from uh, the east side, but my parents, uh, okay. we, moved, we moved out to the Burbs. Um, my mom moved out to the Burbs when I was, uh, my dad had joined custody until I was about 15. And then, then, then I got moved out to the Burbs, um, you know, my teenage years. And then, so when I was like 19 or so, or I think 18. Yeah. I got my first job. I was at Disney. I was, I was, I was a tram announcer. And, um, and I remember every day walking the Esplanade, contemplating my mortality and be like, you know, one day I'm going to die. It'll be like here laid a man who like spoke on the back of the Mickey and Friends, Mickey and Friends tram. So I had a very different experience. I didn't have this like dreamlike experience. Mine was far more proletarian. It was very like <laughs> horrible. And after that, um, I became like, I started working in retail. And then when I started working in retail, again, I was like, well, no, I'm going to die. And here lies a man who folded shirts. So like, <laughs> I had to escape, but this is about me. It's about you. So let's let's talk about your educational journey. So then you, um, you, um, yeah, tell tell us about that. Tell us about um, you know, your path towards. I, um, well, I uh, started off. Uh, um, uh, I guess I don't know. Gosh, I'm trying to think back how far the art went. The art went back pretty far, and I know that I uh, went to. I almost joined the military. I think right out of high school because uh, there were very limited options and I didn't really have a lot of video programs here in Orange County that were public. Uh, so I wanted to be a war photographer. <laughs> and uh, thankfully I was offered a full ride at Chapman University, back then it was Chapman College, um, because I had already done my first music video. So um, I knew a lot of the punk bands in Orange County at that time. And, uh, and it was a really multicultural um, and, um, you know, multi-gender experience. There were a lot of women that were taking photos and were present and I had 63 Corvair. So I was able to drive a lot of the bands like DI, and, um, uh, you know, to their venues and, you know, get compensated. That was my little part-time job during high school. So I was in the thick of some very kind of mythic you know, shows and milieus back when I was a, a teenager. And um, through those associations, I met uh, uh, Joey Escalante from the Vandals. And I made, um, I think one of their first music videos. Um, it was like a, a later album, like the Elvis Decanter or something. So it wasn't Urban Struggle. And I was not old enough to get into clubs back then. I think I was under 17 or 16 or around then when you really don't know what the limits are. So, you know, I just take a, took a community college class so I could get access to equipment. And since I already had this background of, um, you know, you make fantasy happen. You know, I remember, you know, seeing my dad kind of try and visualize how, how's he gonna make a giant bumblebee? Well, he's gonna look at photos of them. He's gonna try and dream up, should they wobble? Should they be on a wiggly base or something? And you just kind of break, break down production into its components. So I intuitively did that. We shot it in the desert and it's, I think it's on MTV somewhere. If you look up the Vandals, Elvis Decanter, that was my first video that got on um, like MTV 120 minutes or whatever the show was. And because of that video, uh, I got uh, headhunted over to Chapman University into their communications program. And from there I, uh, you know, I became the only brown person, you know, for the first time in my life, you know, in a class. So uh, I started hearing about Mecha and, uh, but Mecha wouldn't take me because I'm half Bolivian. So I'm not like full 100% Chicana. My dad's Chicano from El Paso, but I myself am half Chicana, half Bolivian. So that was, I think my first introduction into like the political framework being very complicated that even though I looked like raza that didn't necessarily mean that you know i'm a part of the gang or i'm going to have that kind of community that i'm included in you know so i joined up with the other with central americans <laughs> south americans and we formed macondo which was our like latin american student association in um at Chapman University. And I kept hearing just how shitty the Spaniards were and what colonizers they were when I learned about colonialism. So I wanted to, I wanted to see for myself. I don't like taking other people's word for how the world is. I want to see for myself. I want to experience it for myself. So at, um, I think I was probably 18 or 19, probably 19, 
I got into a, an exchange program and I moved to Spain for two years uh, to Madrid and, uh, and Valencia, which is on the Mediterranean coast. And I saw for myself that the conquerors, the colonizers were a very fractured nation. They were really five nations, five languages in one, and they had their own history of conquest and racism and exclusion and inequity. So that really showed me that it, that the world was more than Mecha yelling at Spaniards, you know, calling people gachupines, that that, that was not gonna be, that black and white world was not gonna be the one that I was going to inhabit. And I got into even more into the arts. I studied art history while I was out there. And I apprenticed, uh, well, I studied with Bill Viola and uh, struck up friendship with Nam June Pike. So it was a great time, you know, in 89 to be in Europe on your own as a teenager, you know, I could drink out there, I could get pretty much into anywhere. And things were very uh, regimented here in America. So I got to see from an outside standpoint that we lived in a really fascist country. I didn't realize how cut off from Latino arts and culture um, we are raised here in America. I, I worked, uh, my, my retail job in high school was working at bookstores. So I worked at all of them, at Brentano's, uh, B. Dalton, okay. Rizzoli, uh, I worked at all of them. I worked at all the bookstores, all the chains, and then eventually got into the, the boutique bookstores. And um, we never had more than Octavio Paz and Sandra Cisneros, maybe Carlos Fuentes. That was it. There was nothing else. So most of the people that I read were, were not people of color. And I wasn't even aware of the wealth of literature that our our culture produced until I moved to Spain, you know, and they're like, Yankee, how can you not know your Chicano authors? How can you not know your Chicano poets? And, um, and that was a, that was an eye opening experience. So by the time I got back to America, um, I had already seen that our nation was fascist, it was very classist, very racist. And I had started to explore some of the amazing uh, literature, film, and, and art that was being produced by our people, because I because I learned about it in Europe, you know, of all places. So when I got back, um, I was uh, definitely a video artist, you know, I did a lot of experimental video work and started getting booked right away into international shows. I got booked into the Cara exhibition in San Francisco as a surround uh, film kind of event and uh, met you know, the amazing Gronk, you know, the artist who, you know, is just like such, has been such a mentor to me. Uh, Chan Noriega, you know, a, a very influential film scholar and curator started to curate my work and um, just met that whole farandula of amazing, you know, Los Angeles, you know, edgy, um, underworld artists, you know, that then I, I moved to LA, you know, uh, to do my, my grad over at UCLA and, and, uh, and just really started falling into that. Then I got into commercial TV and that's when uh, I started doing game shows, which was another kind of surreal kind of uh, experience, you know, so I went from very um, art world pedigree, uh, very experimental, edgy, you know, discourse into, you know, doing promos for Fox Kids and, and uh, the Spanish version of Millionaire, Dating Game, Newlywed Game. I always tried to pick um, Spanish language uh, pr projects so that I could keep a sense of uh, cultural um, Continuity, you know, because I, I saw how people just completely lose themselves in the industry, you know, and they end up, you know, really burning themselves out or really destroying themselves. So I knew that I needed some kind of cultural connection. So that's, that's where I focused my time until I went back into the arts. Oh, I can't hear you. Yeah, no, I, I instead of okay. like throwing my phone across the room when the <laughs> when I, <out. laughs> I should just put it on mute, which I did later. All right, um, the uh, uh, which uh, which were some of the Chicano Chicano um, artists that you came in contact with in Spain? Or what were some of the the, um, the poets and writers that you remember? Uh, 
well, um, I discovered Neruda, who I didn't know before. You know, uh, Pablo Neruda is really, you know, amazing. And um, uh, the, the ASCO collective, of course, you know, um, and uh, Guillermo Gomez Pena, who I very soon um, exhibited with, you know, he was, uh, he was, uh, I guess, enclosing himself in um, uh, these cages along with Coco Fusco at that time. And they were touring as like the, uh, as like, um, as people did, indigenous people were kind of taken around like zoo animals at that, you know, at the turn of the century. And so he was kind of bringing back that kind of commodification fetishization back into play. And, and, that, and there was a lot of native fetishization when I was there, like my nickname was not Bocha, it was Sioux, uh, because I looked like a Sioux Indian, you know, and everyone wanted me to go how, you know, how? Because, <laughs> you know, I was, I looked like some movie Indian, but I had like this surfer girl twang and they couldn't figure me out, you know? So um, I think what I really, really fell into when I was in Europe is after I got tired of looking at all the, all the uh, gilded cherubs and all that old master art, um, I went to the Prado so many times, but I really fell in love with the Dadaists. And I think the Dadaists really, showed me a dimension of punk rock that I was not aware of the whole design history. So when I came back and, you know, connected with the graffiti artists and with Gronk and Harry and, and um, you know, all those guys, Patsy, uh, Chola Conchelo, um, you know, uh, Troy's Cafe, you know, with, with you know, BB uh, was, was you know hopping and that um, actually you know um her her son would work at the or hang out on the couch there at troy cafe you know um uh back so it was just coming right back and I, I met rita gonzalez i think right when i got back um she was i think moving to san diego i was moving back up from san diego from uc san diego when i got back from europe and um and there was just like this amazing you know, exchange Juan Garza, you know, got to um, connect with him early on. Um, uh, Delgado, the, the choreographer, uh, Yvonne Regalado Martin, the opera singer. I mean, there's just, so, I'd be here all day, you know, talking about all those amazing people that were living in, in downtown Los Angeles and creating down there. And so when I went to UCLA for grad, I lived downtown. I didn't want to live in Westwood. I didn't want to live in some soulless, part of town that I felt no connection to. And that whole, all those people really became my tribe. You know, I still keep in touch with Gronk and I think I still have that sensibility and that mockery and lightness, you know, that he doesn't, you know, he, he I think saved me from getting too preachy or too heavy with the message, you know, um, in, in my own work, you know, it's so much about a light touch about, you know, um, embracing the obscurity like you're not trying to go out there and you know like razzle dazzle and be on Broadway you know you want to really focus and um, on on what you're creating and uh, the message you're, you're putting out there is one of poetry and nuance and mystery and not something that you know you're like blah you know save the whales or whatever you know Thing, you don't hit people over the head with it. So, so I think that um, those were the people that I connected with when um, I came back. And I think that, that they very much shaped the, the person I became, you know? And uh, so by the time I think uh, I was ready to leave TV, I was a series producer on a Spanish version of Millionaire. And, you know, it was like those, um, it was like those vampire films where the Latin crew would come in, you know, after hours and get paid, you know, a third, a half the rate. Uh, we had half the budget and, you know, we have the same sets, but we make a completely different product, you know, and um, I, have a, I have a double major, one in visual arts and the other in sociology. So the sociologist in me uh, really saw the different cultural, you know, um, differences that there were between the way Anglos play and play with each other and the way 
you know, Latinos do. Like um, in dating game, you know, Anglos can, you know, they'll like, you know, betray the intimacies of their partner, but, you know, Mexican couples don't do that. They're, they're very loyal to each other. They don't fuck around with each other. They don't mock each other. There's a sacredness to that bond and they don't casually date strangers either. Like in dating game, when we did, you know, Buscando Pareja, like we found, you know, people usually meet people through their families or through their extended, uh, you know, um, networks. They don't just go on blind dates with random strangers. So we had to rework a lot of the way we interpreted those games for the Latin market. And that was a real big education as was learning about the five Latin markets in, in, in America and how they differ, you know, Chicago, New York, Miami, uh, LA, San Antonio, Texas. And uh, eventually, um, as I showcased my own work, my own video art and short films, uh, I made it out to San Antonio on several occasions and um, just saw what, a, what an ombligo and what a, a real center place for, what a place of intersections it was. Central Texas really is something that um, if your show can hit there, it can hit anywhere, you know, because it really is, um, it really has a magical quality of being the crossroads of, of all five markets you know it's like all five markets in one so um i fell in love with that city and later on when my husband uh worked there for a national nonprofit, latino nonprofit, uh nalak uh, we moved out there and we purchased a house there because it was crazy you know we couldn't buy a closet for that in uh in California, and um, and now we have a, we you know maintained a studio there, um, our winter studio there that we um, produce and plan out our year every every year. We go out to Texas to spend some time. You also worked on uh, uh, Telemundo and Univision. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, those experiences? Yeah, the, that that's uh, basically like what I told you. We would basically uh, have uh, you know franchise versions of of uh, English language shows at that time. They were doing, uh, I think, Angels. You know, Angeles, my my neighbor, um, Joseph Julian Gonzalez was working on that. So every morning, you know, I'd be brushing my teeth to the Latino Angeles theme, da 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 da. da you know, and and you know, by the time you know, if my my. Uh, my morning routine was 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 uh, synced up. Then by the time I got to the door, you know, I would have the da 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 da, da and then I'd get to go out, you know, with the flourish, you know, because he would play it every morning as he was doing his episodes. So it was a really, it was really beautiful since I came from a Disneyland kind of pop culture background, you know, with my dad and and his uh, colleagues, you know, all uh, a part of you know union artists, people that um, make a living doing creative work than um, to be in Telemundo and Univision at a time that they're translating these uh, classics, you know, um, I think aside from Angeles, uh, they did a couple of other series, but I know that I, I was over on the game show side. So working with Nellie Galan and that crew who were also trying to translate, you know, kind of Anglo sensibilities for the Latino audience. So. Um, it got really surreal because Los Angeles is not known for, you know, like a real bilingual, um, you know, demographic. You, we've got a lot of people that are Chicanos that don't speak Spanish, you know, super well. Or if they're, if you speak Spanish really great, then you're working three jobs and you don't have time to take the day off and be on a game show. And our prizes are not trips to Acapulco. They're trips to Acapulco restaurant, you know, but not mm -hmm. to Acapulco. So yeah. we would have a hard time getting um, our um, our uh, our contestants. And we could cast, a lot of times we cast actresses or models as our pickers, but the uh, people that were the bachelors, like we would drive pickup trucks to Home Depot and pick up day laborers and uh, give them the Hollywood treatment. We'd give them a shower, wardrobe, haircut, makeup. And sometimes they'd be missing a teeth, you know? But, you know, those were, if you look at uh, Buscando Pareja or those um, uh, Recién Casados videos, you'll see like some real surreal mixes of people. And I think that that was really beautiful um, that we were able to give that surreal experience, just pay the day laborer their, their day rate 
you know, and hey, you're working for us. You're going to be on a game show today. And I, I would love to reconnect with the men, you know, because we brought in a good number, like at least 50 men that way, you know, from the day labor places. And so that was a real surreal time in Los yeah, Angeles. Eligible, eligible bachelors each, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. And then I worked on the Maria Conchita Alonso show. Holy so shit. Was... Oh, oh, I shouldn't cuss on my own show. My uncle played guitar. My uncle's Joe Calderon. Is he, was he in Lava and the Hot Rocks? Yeah, he was a guitar player. Really? For Lava and the Hot Rocks. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes, that was our house band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, my uncle. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, it was a whole family. They had Lava, right, with the mom. Yeah. And then the dad and the kids, I think, all played. And, uh, and they were, yeah, they were a really charming family. I think afterwards, he owned, I don't know if he still does, he owns the catalog for Gordo Records, right? for the West Coast uh, Motown. Like, I, I guess the Motown team came to the West Coast and they tried to do a West Coast Motown and it was called Gordo, Gordo Records. Yeah, and he owned the whole catalog, your that's uncle. A, that's a different member of the band. I mean, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, okay. So, yeah, so I'm not sure who was the, the, the band leader, but yeah, no, it, it, was a, it was, that was an interesting show because Maria Conchita is not really, they tried to turn her into a daytime talk show you know for housewives and she is very far from a housewife or a daytime talk lady she's more of a johnny carson you know bring out the patron we went all over town looking for patron to keep that show supplied um that that was not in general distribution at that time you know patron tequila and uh, and so you know we had um but we had amazing guests everybody from enrique guzman to um you know, Little Joan y La Familia, you know, endless, uh, endless mariachi groups. And, uh, you know, just about everybody who was working at that time was on, was on Maria Conchita's show. It was really amazing to uh, see all those people come in and, and help navigate. You know, I think we had Moenia. We had like all these amazing musical groups on the show. It would be wonderful if someone's kept an archive of the show you know, to kind of review all that. But um, yeah, so I was in the belly of the beast for a while. And then, uh, and then just uh, after I got series producer, I think on Millionaire, I just needed to, I just needed some time out. I'm, I'm sure you know people in the industry and just how all consuming it can be that you really don't see anybody kind of, kind of draw, you know, there, there's no time for family obligations. Sometimes you have to sign you know, um, agreements that you won't leave for funerals or weddings or, you know, it's just, it's, it can be a very toxic place, you know, and also just all the screaming and all of the, um, I did a lot of live TV and, uh, and a lot of our tapings were almost live. So it's like super, super high pressure. And, um, and uh, even though I think I, I thrived in it, I was, I was good at it, that it didn't make it a very healthy endeavor for the long term. And I was always, aware that there would come a time just like you're you were always aware of your mortality at Disneyland <laughs> and at, and in retail I was always aware that there was a time limit that you could be functioning in television and in the industry at that level because the human body can only take so much you know I mean really just the endurance level like you're expected I was working in script a lot of times so, um, you know, you have to wait for all those writer's notes, like you have to wait till the bars close to get all the writing notes, you know, so you're there till 2, 3, 8, 4 a.m. And then you have to be back on set at 6 or 7 a.m. to distribute all the material to everybody. So it's like really just it, it really grinds you down. And I, you know, it also makes you develop either healthy or destructive habits, you know? So that's when, you know, I started really meditating yoga to save my life, you know, doing a lot of um, alternative kind of healing therapies just to be able to um, sustain that level. So once I got out, I went back to books and um, my dad was a real big esoteric and metaphysical guy. He was a follower of Castaneda. So um, while I worked at bookstores, I I was a real um, nerd and um, I understood those esoteric and metaphysical worlds very well. I knew all, most of the authors, you know, our, our dad 
forced us to read most of these while we were living under his roof. We had to read all the Castaneda books. We had to get into um, some, you know, everything from the Theosophists to um, um, Jungian, you know, uh, lore and uh, Aleister Crowley, like a lot of stuff, a lot of freaky stuff, a lot of UFO stuff, a lot of conspiracy stuff. So I was really familiar with that. And I became a book buyer right after leaving TV for the Bodhi Tree in Los Angeles. I used to go in there just to get a break from all the screaming there or Hollywood Forever Cemetery, the only two places in Los Angeles that were not full of people screaming or talking in cell phones. Um, and um, so I always go into that bookstore and the owners um, you know, were really great and were saying, what are you doing in TV? Eventually you're gonna leave and we need you here, come here. And so I was at the Bodhi Tree for uh, three years and it was really, I think a very powerful and defining moment in my life because it was like an it was like an esoteric emotional ER for Los Angeles. I don't know. Did you ever were you ever in that in that realm or in that little part of uh, I guess it was on Melrose over in WeHo, the Bodhi Tree kind of esoteric emporium, and they had a meeting center and. No, like, I was really involved in, 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 in that. In no. the book world. Well, we had Gutenberg Bibles. We had like, you know, like uh, first edition Crowley's and we got some yeah. very crazy, crazy, creepy, uh, you know, uh, Shirley MacLaine out on a limb people, you know, on a regular, very, very much strange uh, phenomenon happening also at yeah. that place. So I was there and I got back into fine arts. Yeah. So can you tell us a little about the Bocha Manifesto? Yes. Uh, that was something I wrote while I was doing a lot of video art. I was at UCLA and, um, and uh, getting a lot of wonderful shows and doing, starting to really apply for grants and fellowships. So it started out as a, I think it was a fellowship application where I was talking about, it was like my artistic statement and I didn't get it, but some of the advisors that were around me thought, hey, you know, you should really publish this as a standalone essay or as a manifesto because it really talks about what your origins are and the place of women in art making because, um, I don't think I'm a conventional woman, you know, I don't have children at that time. I was very much about um, challenging a lot of the female conventions to the point where before I became Bocha Peña, I was actually SM Peña because I didn't really want people to know that I was female because I saw so much bias in the art world that most of the male artists would get booked or taken seriously. And the female artists were really relegated to being muses or girlfriends or studio assistants. And I didn't want that path for myself. So that manifesto was really talking about a lot of the role of women in the creative process and how, um, you know, we needed to bust out of this, you know, giver, nurturer role and really, you know, take for ourselves the things that we needed to find for ourselves what what we needed to create and to be uh, um, and to have some um, agency you know within our professional and personal life so that's that's kind of like the main thing and also I thought um, at that time because of my background with Disney I really felt that it's great to be in the fine arts but that we really needed to like flood the commercial economy and commercial production as infiltrators, you know, and as creative infiltrators that it's, it's wonderful to be a fine artist, but really where you influence the, the mass population, like Che Guevara says, right? You need to seize, you need to seize the means of communication. And so you need to learn those languages. You need to learn to, um, to role play and pass and be, able to function within those meeting rooms as much as you're able to function within, you know, your, your fringe communal elements, you know, it's important to, to have multiple roles that way. So that's, that's a lot of what the Bocha Manifesto uh, was about. And now it's been reprinted in um, different books and journals and film festival catalogs. So that's, that's been really wonderful. I want to move now to talk about the OC Film Fiesta as well as uh, your collaboration with uh, Victor Payan. But before we do that, uh, we have a question from the audience. 
and it says, asked us, tell us about some of the uh, uh, prizes the contestants won on these shows. Ah, the prizes would be things like, uh, yeah, like Acapulco Seafood Restaurant in uh, Montebello, you know, or it would be like a set of, you know, mixing bowls, you know, or, you know, free pizza for a week. It would, they, they weren't very good prizes. They were actually pretty sucky prizes. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of that had to do with, we didn't have the, the budget. You know, we didn't have a prize budget like, uh, like the Anglo shows did. So they tended to be real cheesy, chunty <laughs> kind of prizes, you know, like you'd get a free album, you know, um, you'd get like, a, you know, some kind of autograph swag of something so that you know but usually they were um vouchers for restaurants almost always they were vouchers for restaurants in in uh, montebello or in east la or you know some such place not even glendale <laughs> you know so um yeah not the best prizes yeah all right so let, let's let's talk about the oc film fiesta well um the OC Film Fiesta, I transitioned from doing production, like I said, into book buying. And then uh, I got the opportunity to uh, open a gallery in my hometown of Santa Ana. So uh, it seemed like a good time to uh, re-engage with that community. And I started showing films at the gallery because, you know, that was so much a part of, of my love for films, our old silent films. And, uh, and I'm a big history nerd and definitely a big history nerd about my hometown here in central Orange County. Um, so when I started kind of plugging back into this community and to dealing with the civic issues that I saw persisting after having been gone for so long um, for school and then a decade of working in Los Angeles, uh, when I came back, I was really surprised that a lot of the issues that I left Santa Ana, you know, in um, frustration with, you know, the the poverty, the lack of infrastructure for artists, the racism, um, the corruption, the homelessness, all the issues that I I saw and had to deal with as a, as a young person, as, as a youngster in Orange County, a lot of them were still persisting and there was a lot more money being thrown at the arts, but it really wasn't in an equitable way. And, um, and there were a lot of communities that were still just not even being seen or addressed in the city. So as I started to um, kind of replug in to that municipal infrastructure and that civic life in my hometown, uh, there was an opportunity, it was an RFP for a film festival. They were trying to integrate their Cinco de Mayo festival, or I think it was their, their Fiestas Patrias festival. There was a lot of new, uh, mostly Anglo people that were moving back into uh, downtown uh, central uh, Orange County, downtown Santa Ana. And they didn't feel like they had a connection with these very um, ethnic, uh, festivals of 16 de September and Cinco de Mayo. So there, somebody proposed that maybe if they did an RFP for a film festival, that would be that would provide a point of entry for people basically that were not brown to have something to go for, right? I, that's what I understood. And um, I, being such a big proponent of film and video, I feel it is one of the most immersive ways to communicate. Uh, culture to another human being because you see it, you hear it, you know, you you can have a real immersive video experience. You know, you can convey a lot of information from a film, from a documentary about about someone's living condition. Um, uh, you know, international film certainly does that. You know, third world cinema. So I thought if I could do something like third world cinema and and crack open the different communities in Santa Ana at this annual showcase that the city is providing this annual showcase, I could put together like something that was really transformative and will really help touch upon and shed light of every, you know, just every part of Santa Ana will be given a platform. So I put together a proposal and uh, I think there were four years of RFP that you could apply. And uh, I mean, normally you apply one and then they give you the other three, you know, you apply once, you apply twice, and then you get like the rest of the years. 
but I applied every single time. So I applied against other people that were pitching their festivals and their concepts. And, um, but I was the local, I was the person who was homegrown, who knew all of the quadrants of the city, who lived, you know, my, my dad lived across, you know, the city. So I would always have visitation with him and have to go into the hardcore hood, you know, of Artesia Pilar that used to be a uh, little Texas, the black part of town. And, um, you know, I went to school at St. Anne's, you know, Catholic University. So I, I really had grown, I really was a product of this, of this community and the city. So every year I really put so much into, it was a free festival, so you couldn't charge for it to tell all of our stories from Mendes versus Westminster to the African-American story to the, you know, there, there were issues between like one of our council women called one of our major uh, property owner investors, uh, Hitler, and he's Jewish, you know, and, and so uh, I did a whole highlight on Latino Jews, you know, on the, on the Tijuana Jews, you know, um, we had an issue with homelessness. So then I did a whole cycle on, you know, on, you know, homeless cinema, uh, I think uh, I, I did five uh, five visions of the Mexican Revolution because we're trying to crack open the Mexican Revolution for a more diverse audience. I mean, non Latino audience. So I did, you know, uh, Viva Maria, which is a, a French look starring Bridget Bardot of the Mexican Revolution. We did, um, I think it was, you know, Viva Zapata, Hollywood treatment of the Mexican Revolution. We did uh, something by Sergei Eisenstein, I think I Am Mexico, which is a Russian perspective of the Mexican Revolution in 1930s uh, Mexico. So we were really, you know, we were looking at all the different facets of culture and the cultural mixes here in Orange County and also wanted to tie, I wanted to tie it into past, uh, like our, our silent cinema and Hollywood um, history here. You know, Rita Hayworth had a dance studio here in Santa Ana. Um, Charlie Chaplin was said to have married one of his wives here. Uh, Beeb Daniels, the Argentine silent film star, um, she was uh, jailed here for 10 days in the 1920s for speeding. So that we have all these, you know, Desi Arnaz, Lucille Ball used to hang out here. Uh, Orson Welles went duck hunting, you know, down by uh, at Gospel Swamp. So all these things, I mean, I could just be here all day talking about all these obscure little Santa Ana uh, you know, trivia and history, but I, I knew them all and I knew all the films that would tap into them. So, you know, I was hiring my film friends from Los Angeles. So every year we would have somebody dress up like Zorro or Beeb Daniels and we'd get the classic cars out and we would tell those stories. And, um, and I think that a lot of that has now been picked up by our downtown boosters and other people. I, I worked really hard to bring like our Day of the Dead festival that was in South Santa Ana. I brought it to downtown Santa Ana, uh, sponsored it, you know, worked out all the paperwork, did all of the, you know, all of the meetings with the city to clear, you know, to clear that to happen at the artist village. And now look today, today it's like one of the biggest Day of the Dead festivals. It's still in downtown Santa Ana, you know, now it's split in two, it's two giant Day of the Dead Festival. So really just, just the way you can, you can bring art into prominence or open it up, make it more available to people. That really fascinated me. And that's when I started really civically engaging with City Hall, which was something that was something that I couldn't dreamed I would have done before. So it's very much from the punk rock, you know, outsider tradition where, you, you know, you don't play with the man, you don't talk to him, you know, you don't give him the time of day. But then when I'm sitting in city council meetings and I'm starting to formulate, hey, there's a way that you can converge this theatrical, creative, artistic presentation and training and knowledge of how that system works and merge it with the art, with the activist. You know, I've been going to protests since, you know, the peace tests in, in Nevada, like in the 80s, you know, so I, you know, all through the Gulf War protests, I was usually taking photos. So I knew that activist world well, we just needed to merge the two in a way that the message could pierce through the armor of people that wanted to dismiss it or, you know, dehumanize it and just not engage. And we need those intersections to happen. We need those human beings to connect and intersect if we're really gonna have meaningful change. And that's a part of humanizing the process, making the process something that people will want to, you know, taste, maybe chew on, swallow, <laughs> you know?
you know, we, we, we want to create and encourage those engagements. So that's, I think, when I started working with Victor um, at, the, at a film festival in San Diego, because after my gallery I started doing film festivals, um, doing after doing screenings of my own, Santa Ana Film Festival, I did uh, worked on Eddie Olmos's film festival, La Leaf in LA. Uh, I worked at um, San Diego Latino Film Festival where I reconnected with Victor Payan. And part of going down to San Diego was re-engaging with the Centro. I w was a big member of the Centro when I was an undergrad and then to go back and see what tatters it was in. It was under boycott when I went back there to do the festival. And it was really sad to see Guillermo Gomez Pena, Isaac Ardenstein, every, all the giants that were there no, were gone. And what happened? What happens when a cultural center gets taken over by real estate agents and bankers? Like, what does that look like? How do people justify that? And so in advocating for that, um, I got back into this activist artist thing with Victor Payan. So when we came up here, then we went to Texas and we helped with the Guadalupe with bringing that film festival back. That was almost at a point where they weren't going to have it anymore. So we were able to, you know, restructure that and bring that back. And now it's continuing. And then when we came back to Santa Ana, you know, we, we had had the string of successes of, intersecting, you know, kind of uh, social practice, theater craft and activism. So that's what Victor calls practical social practice, where you actually, your social practice results in actual policy um, changes that benefit the, you know, the, the audience. So it's more than just a feel good take home little artifact that you get to have or a macaroni sculpture or something, you actually get to have a change in policy. Um, so that's something that um, we got more and more involved with and it, and it, uh, it also ended with us um, getting an art commission created here in Santa Ana. There was no art commission. It was just run by random people, usually white, that would pop up every now and then, take all the money, then disappear. And then like there was no infrastructure progress for there was no equitable progress for the residents here. So we created an art commission. I, I ended up becoming an art commissioner, then the chair of the art commission. Then I ended up running for office, you know, because I started building momentum. We, we got, a, I think a 60 unit, all artists, low income housing built here in Santa Ana. There's still some spots available. There's two and three bedrooms if anyone's interested. And it's all low income. And we, we went to DC to advocate for that. So then I learned about low income housing and the different you know, demographics that that's available for. So it just all the, like the layers of the onion as I started thinking, hey, I'm gonna help fix the things I'm an artist, I'm gonna help fix the things that I know are broken in my hometown, I, using all these skills I have. And then just, you just keep going deeper, you keep going deeper. And then you're like, hey, I need to be at that table. I need to be at that table. Hey, I'm being blocked over here. I need to be at that table. And so then you're just like, hey, you're in my seat. You know, I need, I need a spot at the table now because all these other people that you've been ignoring my whole life, like it's time to stop ignoring them. And, uh, and that was in itself, it's its own, um, its own education, because again, it was like a whole nother world of where you start to see the influence that money and mailers have, you know, I mean, I was cast as as a drug dealer, right, because I must be a drug dealer, I must be some gangster drug dealer, because, you know, what, what other frightening um, kind of a, of an image of Mexican Americans can we have, you know, my, my demographic, uh, because I, I teach video also to youth. So my demographic are parents and students and educational uh, workers. So what would scare them more than to know that their, their media arts teacher is like a gangster, you know, like, you know, Emma loving drug dealer. I mean, that's horrible, but that's what the mailer said. And, and they cast me as that the the head of the debate team <laughs> for the district i mean we were all educators uh coaches running together because we cared about you know the inadequacies that that kids have to deal with you know i mean i left when i was 16 because there was nothing for me here i don't want other 16 year olds being pressured into that it's a much more dangerous world than than when i got out in the 80s i think and um, so that's that's something that I've been in. Now I've now thankfully with the creative capital, you know, me and Victor have 
oh, Aztec gold, we've got so many, you know, the Lucha Libre thing, now we're doing Dreamocracy. I think we, we worked so well together uh, as uh, just as people, like we could argue and fight and be fed up with each other, but then still clock in the next day and we can still have a civil conversation. Like, that's the skill, that's the skill. So eventually, you know, everyone kept saying, hey, you guys are such a great team. Are you sure you're not dating? And it's like, oh no, no. And then eventually it's like, well, you know, am I being an idiot, you know, that, uh, you know, am I turning my back on, on compatibility? Am I being, you know, am I clinging so much to not having a place that I'm, I'm giving up a place that is here for me, you know? And so it's really good to have, to have somebody on my team that's, that's there. And we're kind of in lockstep thought, thought wise, and we complement each other technique wise. Cause he's, he's the egghead, uh, documentarian researcher and I'm the pop culture you know like costumes background pizzazz sizzle person yeah it's kind of like a like um the Vanessa Williams song you know like uh, sometimes <laughs> and, you know the couch you know, so sometimes you know this was in this world a crazy place uh you, you gotta say the best for last except like he's Victor's Vanessa Williams in this in this scenario <laughs> Victor's Vanessa Williams, you know, in this scenario. Um, so. we both take turns being tough. I think we, we have, our, I think our strengths are complementary. No, that, that, that's wonderful. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to pose a question to you that I've posed to, uh, I had the poet, um, uh, uh, Jose Alderte, um, on, and he kind of goes by, uh, Pocho, the Pocho handle, I can't remember exactly what it is. I uh, had Pocho Joe on, Dr. Victor, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pose the same question to you that I posed to them. If you were to have to create a, a Mount Pochmore, right? Like in you know, like a Mount Rushmore, like who would be like the most iconic Pochos that you would put in in, in a on your Mount Pochmore? Well, you know, on Mount Pochmore, I would definitely be there. Pocha Peña. Because uh, I remember, and the Pocho guys from Pocho Magazine would have to be there, you know, Lalo, Lalo, and... Uh, um, four people, it's about Pocho more. You gotta, you gotta be selected here. There's four, right? Yeah, yeah, Myself, yeah. Lalo. I have to put Victor there. There'll be no peace in, 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 the, in the household. Get one more. Get one I, would, more. I would say Pochoa in Texas because they were, I, I think the four of us were doing it first before anybody else because I know that I was I came I was being called pocha that's how I became pocha is that I was being called pocha so much um that and I did I was such a pocha I didn't know what it meant you know so I was being called a pocha at the Mexican market here in Santa Ana or when I went to Tijuana and I walked the gauntlet of of um taxis they'd all start chanting pocha 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 and I'm like oh, damn. what is that so I'd come home with my Texas dad and I'd say hey what does bocha mean? And he'd be like, who's calling you that? And it was be like, everybody's calling me that. Is it bad? What does it mean? And when he told me, it's like, you're a cultural misfit. It's like, it's like you're stupid in two cultures. And I was like, oh my God, that's me. I am stupid in two, that's me. I'm going to be bocha peña. And he's all, that's like calling yourself stupid peña. You know that, right? And I'd be like, you know, I, that's what I'm going to be. And I got my business cards printed up. I went to Gronk's because I was so like, you know, like I had to show him, you know, I was like, look, look, I'm going to take back this word, just like my brother's taking back queer, you know, and it's a good thing. I'm going to take back bocha and it's going to be a good thing. So we are queer. And then he said, oh, I'd like you to meet someone. Come over here. And he introduced me to Elias Sennas, who was passing out the very first issue of Bocho magazine. Yeah. And it was like, well, right there, we were, we, it was the gestalt. We were, we were thinking about it. We we're vibing um, how to reclaim that outcast, that, um, that insult, you know, how are we going to claim that back with authenticity and love and empowerment? Like, like, I, like I saw the queers doing, it's like, yeah, we could do it too. And then um, shortly thereafter, I heard about Bochoa in Texas, the, um, the theater troupe that was doing the same thing, playing with those concepts of, of outsider and pariah that Bochos are. And as um, if we could have a fifth, I mean, honorary, I think now is La Pocha, La Pocha Nostra, certainly 
you know, um, you know, Guillermo Gomez Pena, who was a big mentor and one of the first people I exhibited with in, in the early 90s. And uh, after being the border brujo, you know, he, uh, I hope, got some inspiration from his little cousin, little prima, little art prima, chola, you know, pocha. And, uh, and became La Pocha Nostra. And now that is, you know, such a mythic concept and such an amazing troupe. And it's been such an honor and such a um, thrill to now be collaborating Pocha with La Pocha and, uh, and doing work together. I mean, that really is a dream come true. I've looked up to him for a long time and uh, drawn a lot of inspiration from them. But, you know, it's kind of interesting, this idea that, like, um... The pocha, I mean, and um, in, in your early story being, you know, it's kind of like you had to kind of um, recover these kind of cultural legacies and things to connect to that were, you know, for lack of a better term, just brown, right? And then you kind of grew up kind of steeped in like Orange County and kind of like a rebel culture, but kind of a white dominated kind of rebel culture. And yet when it comes time to like make art, you're a fucking chola. You're 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 this like bad. You're like this. You're you get you get you hit with all the like Mexican stereotypes, regardless of like the actual cultural signifiers that like are in your mind, or the actual things that you're aware of, the actual things that like kind of you know make you who you are, right? Or, or made you made you who you are early. There's there's no escaping it. I mean, it's still there's still these things are still gonna hit you like no matter what, like no matter what your background is. You could be a cl classically trained pianist. You could be you know, play the violin, you could be like an accountant, you could whatever, no matter what, these things are still gonna, they're, they're still gonna fall upon you. There's no, there's no, there's no escaping it, right? So um, what's, what's, what's kind of interesting to me, what I really wanna ask you is that, um, you know, I pose this question to a few other people, what is, it seems to me that we face these two different kind of uh, oppressions um, when it comes to, you know, media and, and just literature and just, you know, the, the academy and all kinds of things in general is that we're both underrepresented and we're misrepresented. And that sometimes I think in the fight against misrepresentation and under, under uh, against the fight against underrepresentation, we allow ourselves to be misrepresented, right? That, like, that happens so often because we figure something's better than nothing or something like that. So how do we fight these things simultaneously? Misrepresentation and underrepresentation. Well, I think we have to speak for ourselves. I mean, we can't, as long as we're filtered through somebody else's reality, and through somebody else's, you know, worldview, they're, they're always going to get it wrong, just like we would get it wrong if we were interpreting their experience, right? I mean, I think the experiencer needs to be the conveyor of the experience. And ultimately, that's what true equity is, you know, everybody should have the right to tell their own story, you know, I shouldn't have to depend on someone that doesn't get it and doesn't want to get it, you know, to tell my story, I should be able to tell my own story. And, um, and I think that tapping into a system that doesn't honor you or, you know, care about your existence is ultimately not really a winning game. You know, that's maybe in theory, there's little small steps towards, um, towards equity or towards justice. But in reality, there's no small steps. There's giant uh, surges forward when people have reached their limit and they push forward. They don't, they don't take little small, you know, steady steps. That's not how cultural and social change happen. You know, you, you take it. And I think part of my, um, the reason why I believe that is because I, besides being raised in, you know, the Mexican American culture and then the dominant culture of Disneyland and, and that pop land, um, because I'm half Bolivian, I started spending my summers in Bolivia when I was an infant. Like when I was a few months old, my mom started taking me to Bolivia every summer. And, um, and that was a radically different world than the first world America. Because in Bolivia, I, I found children and uh, communities that didn't use money. They didn't want money. And that was, that blew my mind <laughs> because in America, it, it, we don't realize how much it is about money. It is about the worship of money 
and currency and what it can get you, what it doesn't get you, the shame of not having it, of uh, wanting to be a part of it. You know, you aspire to be a Kardashian or, you know, in, in the dominant culture, you know, you want to be consuming at that level. And if you don't, then you fucked up, son, you know, and, and that's the larger American paradigm. But in Bolivia to have the money and have somebody not want it, I'm just like, what? You don't want blue jeans? You don't care? You don't care at all about being a part of any system? Like that was, that just blew my mind, you know? And then as I was growing up with my cousins, um, I have a cousin that like, you know, ran away with her boyfriend to the countryside. You know, her, her family had some land and they ran away, you know, because their families were against them being together. And they said, you know, well, when we run out of food, you know, we'll just go down the little native village and we'll buy our food. And, you know, there were, there were lovers. So they ran out of food, they went down and the natives were like, we don't want your money. Like, what, what are we gonna do with your money? We have to spend your money to go somewhere to, that where they accept money to buy something that we don't need. Like we have everything we need. Your money would be disruptive to this. What do you have to trade? Like what, maybe we can give you a credit on your crop or we could take a part of your forest and it would be like, so I think I was always brought up with that idea that you don't, you don't have to take somebody else's built system as your system. You don't have, that's not always healthy for you. And what, what Evo Morales, you know, taught us like these last 12 years before the coup. And I saw it for myself because I was in Bolivia last summer and I'm so glad I got to see the full flowering of what he had created was a true equity. What the natives said, you know, F this playing nice and being a part of this, you know, like first world dream. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to continue in authenticity with systems we ourselves create that ensure our equity first, first. We're not going to let you tell our story. We're going to tell our story. We want someone that looks like us, that has our heritage representing us. And this is what that looks like. It looks like her. It looks like him. It looks like them. And that was really a very powerful moment, not just for Bolivia, but I think for planet Earth to see indigenous people creating their own structures, telling their own stories, launching their own satellites named Tupac Amaru. Look it up on YouTube. It's amazing. You know, just the, the marketing campaign they did for the Tupac Amaru first indigenous, you know, satellite system. They really reinvented um, the paradigm because it was it was their creation and that's that's what i aspire to and even in in my political advo you know advocacy for people it's it's almost like i the, the way i uh, interpret it for people is you know when you're in high school i had a very bad high school experience i really hated it i hated junior high i hated high school more and I almost didn't want to go to college because high school seemed so horrible. You know, people were horrible, teachers were horrible. I didn't connect to anything that I was learning. I felt talked down to and marginalized. And I thought, how could higher learning be better than this misery? And then you get into college and you're like, holy, F, it's so much better. I don't have class every day. I don't have these idiots trying to, you know, control me, not really educate me. You know, it's, I, I can choose what I study. College is, is, is like, you finally your, your, your wings unfurl, you know, compared to how it was in high school. It was like a prison for me. And I, and that's what I see challenging the paradigm is like when you start small in your municipality, in your city, you think, oh my God, I'm, Pueblo Chico, Infierno Grande, you know, like there's just, it's just going to be more horrible when I get out of here. Maybe I'll go to the big city. Now I got to deal with a bigger fucked up paradigm. Okay, now I'm going to go to the state. And you start to see how things loosen up when you start dealing at a state level. Then you're like, you know what, I'm going to go national because I'm already doing the work. I'm already dealing with the headaches. Why the fuck am I ghetto ghettoizing myself in this little neighborhood or this little city or this little region? I'm freaking going for the goal. And then you start having the national conversations, now you're really getting somewhere. Now you're actually having paradigm shifting opportunities where you can bring your expertise, you can represent your people, you can change things in a way that it opens it up to more voices and to people telling their own stories. 
And that's, that's really what I'm about. So I think that I do that in my, in my artwork, in, uh, in the opportunities I create for people and, and in the civic world, you know, it's about giving people the opportunity to tell their own stories. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. All right, well, it's, it's been an incredible uh, hour spent. Uh, can you tell us how we can, uh, how we can connect to the work you're currently doing and, um, and what's next? Yeah, you can go to uh, pocharte.com. That's P-O-C-H-A-R-T-E.com, the art of the pochas, pocharte. Uh, and uh, you'll find links there to some of the other work that, that I'm doing. You can also go to Dreamocracy in uh, america.org uh so the democracy in america the de tocqueville inspired uh, project dreamocracy because i think a, a big move towards creating anything new you know in the tangible sense or in the magical sense is you really need to envision it and feel that with some intent so part of you know creating that that uh that landscape of visions of envisioning um, and, you know, using all these wonderful voices and perspectives to, to get us there, we can start to map out alternative, alternative paradigms for this suffering nation that we're in right now. So dreamocracy uh, in America.org or bocharte.com. Well, that's been fantastic. And I really appreciate uh, you spending this hour with us and um, everyone go check out that. We'll, we'll drop the links below. And um, it's been a real honor. Thanks so much, Mr. Cedillo. I'll <laughs> keep you. reading your poetry there. Speak soon.